You listen to Kendrick and Matt on the Slip and Dip podcast. Oh, beautiful, man. What is up, people? Welcome back to the Slip and Dip podcast, episode 121. Coming at you on the heels of the fight of the century. YouTube sensations in action. KSI Logan Paul threw down in the professional ranks of boxing. We'll get into all of that. I am Matthew Wells alongside me as always Kendrick Johnson. Kendrick, the fight of the century, right? <laughs> Not the fight of the century, but it definitely was entertaining. I know I laughed out loud like a good three times in that fight. From the referee to the fighters themselves. Doing everything you're not supposed to do, but it worked for the fight. To me, I, I would, I would, uh, I would have, I would mind been there ringside and entertained. It was entertaining to me. They, they're entertainers and they entertained. They did what they supposed to do. Neither one of them said, "Well, I take that back." Logan Paul didn't say he gonna be a boxer. Hey, stop all that. Yeah. So I, I was surprised the defenses were actually like somewhat legit. And like Logan Paul, I think he was too technical. He was trying to like have the perfect jab and snap it out. He wasn't fighting. Yeah, he was he was trying to be he was trying, definitely trying to be too technical. Before we get to the deep dive on today's show, we have four guests for you. We stacked it up this week. We have one for Ras Sahabi, Trainer Champions, Trisar, GSP, Kevin Lee now, Rory McDonald. You know the names. You know the guy for Ras Sahabi. So well, now, uh, Mr. Larry Wade is on the program. Soon to be world renowned. Soon to be world renowned strength and conditioning coach. Um, trainer to a lot of boxing names like Taylor Plant, Luis Ortiz, mm-hmm. Sean Porter, mm-hmm. and KSI himself. That's why he was in shape. 100%. 100%. Uh, Mike Brown, ATT, another trainer, world renowned trainer. Uh, Yoani and Jacek, Jorge Masvidal, you know those names over there at ATT as well. We'll talk to him, get an update from the gym. And one, Miguel Flores, who's getting ready to take on Leo Santa Cruz in the co main event of the Luis Ortiz. Deontay Wilder rematch here in uh, a couple of weeks on the 23rd. So uh, we talked to him about his big opportunity, an opportunity to shock the world and knock off a, uh, a heavy favorite in that fight. That was Andy Ruiz moment. Absolutely. So let's get back to it, man. Let's get back to it real quickly. I don't want to spend all night on the fight of the century. I mean, you know. <laughs> but hey, KSI Logan Paul threw down. And were you, were you surprised? Because yeah, I think you were the people, you were the one of the haters. I want to give them their props. It was a lot better than what you what, thought it was going to be. What, what, wait, what, why should I be giving them props for one? What, what do I have to give them props for? They were there to entertain, and they entertained. <laughs> so they weren't there to, they there to put on the show. They put on the show. Did they, did they not put on the show? They just, <laughs> it's funny. Listen, if you, have, if you have 30 million people that subscribe to you on YouTube, if you show up and do anything, it's going to be entertaining to a lot of people. The the crowd, the majority of the crowd was a lot of younger folks, a lot of YouTube's, quote unquote YouTube celebrities or influencers or however you guys want to use that word these days, which is so weird. I hate that <laughs> word, influencer. Um, but yeah, like it, I don't, I'm not buying into the whole notion that everybody was throwing around that this was great for boxing and we're going to gain a whole slew of new boxing fans from this. I don't agree with that whatsoever. I think this is a one-off to where people saw two guys that they know from YouTube do something that's essentially a, an elaborate YouTube video, essentially. That's what this was. YouTube video. Essentially, that's what this is. If you go to their, both of their YouTube channels, they do random shit. They do random shit. It's entertaining as hell. Um, and this is a simply another version of that. It's the second time they fought. Yeah, they did a, the pro style. They both trained their asses off. I'm not trying to discredit that or anything like that, but I, I'm not buying into this whole notion that this is great and it's going to revive the sport of boxing and all that. Yeah, I'm sure DAZN spiked a few subscribers. I'm sure they did. <laughs> uh, hit, hit me hit me in a couple of months and see how many people retained. That's what I'm curious about. That's what I'm curious about. But y'all people that don't really know how DAZN works, it's not going nowhere. That's I'm, crazy. I'm not saying be. it's not going anywhere. I'm just saying, like, did this is is this fight gonna be that pivotal moment that grew a, a whole new slew of boxing fans? I don't think so. Yeah, I but boxing I'm not, started, like I'm not riding with that. I'm not riding with that notion. I'm not with it. Um, I do want to talk about the two moments that the this is the last thing we're gonna talk about on this fight. Um, <laughs> the two moments, the two moments in the fight that were kind of controversial. This, this first picture is the picture of KSI's knockdown where he hit Logan on the side of the head and he immediately goes down to a knee. 
It looks like he's trying to get a nice little double leg action going. But he dropped <laughs> down on the canvas. They didn't call it a knockdown. Robbed the man of his of his point in the round. Right? Then this other picture is of Logan Paul getting a knockdown. But because he wobbled him with that nice uppercut. uppercut, the uppercut. That, was, that was the best punch of the whole fight was this uppercut that Logan Paul landed. But then he immediately went full amateur mode and started fouling the shit out of KSI as he was rocked. <laughs> and <laughs> gets, gets two points. Like, they credited never, the knockdown. I, I never seen that. And then they that. took two points. I guess, I guess it took a real fight to see something you've never seen before because he didn't even get a warning. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen people get points, multiple points that they get away from them. People are like, that's never happened. It's happened in a championship fight. But they were repeatedly fouled. Like Andrew Galata hit, um, I don't know if it was Lennox Lewis or, or uh, Riddick Bow in the nuts at like three times, and he got two points. Yes. But he got repeatedly warned. It wasn't this, hey, two points is out the blue. It's like, whoa. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Now, in the co-main event, um, they actually had a swing bout in between the co-main event and – the main event last night, but one young Devin Haney, man, a real what? championship boxer, showcased his skills. He needed to fight in there some real championship opposition, though. Yeah, I, I mean, hey, this was the real fight to me. Like, this is the most competitive fight of the evening. He went out there, showed off some of his things, you know, showed off his skills. I, I, I actually showed watched a, a little promise. bit of it. This is because because it's him. Because he's a, he's elite, like he's a he's a special talent. But um, out of all the fights of the night, because um, I didn't watch the Billy Joe Saunders that nonsense. Yes. ESPN Plus had um, Jamel Herring and um, uh, Lamont Rose Jr. I watched like two rounds of that, like they would put me to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, trying to watch them and get ready for KSI now. Like the YouTube fight was way lived up to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it surprised some of y'all, but hey, they came, they showed up and showed out and entertained. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of energy in the building, no doubt. Can't take away from that. Um, it was a spectacle. It was a circus. And I mean, hey, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, so yeah, Devin Haney, congrats on that win, as expected. Um, YouTube, uh, not YouTube. Wow, UFC had a card as well, um, all the way out in Moscow. Um, I didn't see the entire card. I was out doing doing the the weekend shopping thing. So I was trying to watch on my phone, but I did catch a lot of it. Uh, main event, Magomed Sharapov. Oh, he got pushed. Yeah, I mean, look, it was it was it was an okay fight. Nothing wasn't really anything too special. Uh, but Zabit walks away with the with his hand raised. Uh, co-main event was the one that I think well, most I, people were interested in. I did watch. I did watch that. Pops to Greg Hardy. People thought he was gonna get smoked. He looked like a legit top ten fighter up in there. He held his own, kept his distance, and I wonder if his hand would have broke if he would have rocked him because the couple times he did hit him with that right hand, he did not like it. But Maybe. we never know. But he definitely got some ways to go. But he's a lot closer than what people thought. To be at the top of the mountain than what people thought before yesterday. I'll, I'll agree with that, but uh, yeah, he's still got a lot of lot to work on. He's still growing, still learning. Um, I mean, he stepped in there against a top ten opponent on two weeks' notice, and went the distance with a, with a, with a hurt hand. Um, again, people are gonna hate on Greg Hardy for everything, regardless. So, I mean, you know, take it for what it is. Hey, he stepped in there. He this is a guy who didn't know how to throw a punch two years ago, and just went in there. On two weeks' notice against the top ten guy, and uh, didn't get finished. So, props to him. He didn't really even get hurt. He no. just he just got outpointed. Um, the better skilled striker did what he had to do. You know, he stuffed his takedowns. Volkov did. Craig Hardy went for a couple of takedowns, I believe. Yeah, two of them, and uh, got them both stuffed. But you know, <laughs> here's what it is. One thing I do want to show, uh, man, Danny Roberts, Dan Hot Chocolate Roberts. Showing a clip on YouTube right now. Hell of a knockout Ooh, this dude had. That. And he did not get a bonus for this knockout, which is crazy. I don't know why the UFC keeps snubbing this man on bonuses. But he has... Listen, anytime Danny Roberts fights, he's producing a spectacular finish or he is getting finished spectacularly. <laughs> but <laughs> it's always exciting to put it to put it that way. It's always exciting. Hell of a knockout right there. Oh, that, that was something as we were walking through the through the uh, furniture stores like oh shit <laughs> I had to catch myself I had to catch you myself edited, you ended up in the store bro yes man yes <laughs> yes 100% but uh, yeah uh, you know there's some other good moments on the card we're not going to go through everything um, but uh, you know I'm, I'm just still waiting for this 
this title fight. Like everything between Kamar Usman and Colby Covington is just like I don't know. I don't know what to call it, but it's just filler. <laughs> Not to disrespect any of the athletes, because there's obviously a lot of good fights in between now and then, but you know, that's that's what really what I'm looking forward to on my radar. Yeah, definitely that, that car definitely I don't even, I'm not even looking to for Max fight. I'm not ready for that one and see Amanda Nunes do Amanda Nunes things. Because every time we see her, she do something like that. I just see that. Hopefully, hopefully it ends up being one of those cards where it's like, oh, man, Amanda Nunes, that was a great fight. And it's like, oh, wait, we got two more fights. Oh, man, Max Holloway and, and uh, Volkanovski was a great fight. Oh, snap, now we got the real deal. You know, ho- hopefully that night plays out like that, which I think it will. And I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, there's a lot of good fights on that card. I'm really excited for it. How do you think Jermaine can remotely win that fight? I mean, she's got to she's got to keep her keep Amanda away from her and not not get into this that ego like it's like those years she's not Brazilian. <laughs> can't get into a war. She got she's got to stay she's like a uh, cyborg did it. She did not live to tell about it. No, no, she did not. Um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, we're I think that's pretty much all we're going to talk about from this weekend. We got a lot to, lot. A lot to talk about with these interviews, guys. we got four interviews coming your way. So we're going to get into those in just a second. But first, before we do get out of here with you guys this week on click, episode 121. Um, click that subscribe button. But smash that bell. Yeah, hit that subscribe button. Click the bell. You know, you know the routines. You know the vibes. <laughs> but also check out our merch section. We have merch, people. So grab yourself a t-shirt. Grab yourself a hoodie. we got multiple colors. All that good stuff. You know, grab yourself a Slipping Dip Podcast logo tee. We would appreciate it. You know, pick them up. We got the links in the description, so click on it. Check it out. Uh, multiple colors and sizes and everything like that. Grab one for a, uh, a loved one, a friend of the show, somebody that loves combat sports and watches the show. Grab a hoodie. Grab a t-shirt. Something you can do to help support the show. Um, if you don't want to, you know, grab some merch. Hey, and if you're listening on iTunes, please leave us a review. Five-star review. That's something free you can do to help grow the show. Helps the visibility out, so we would appreciate that. Um, but that's going to do it for the intro to 121. Four, four interviews coming your way. Like Kendrick said, hit that subscribe button. We would appreciate you guys and uh, appreciate all the love we get in the comments, all the likes, all that good stuff as well. So keep those coming. Uh, anything else before we get out of here? No, we're going to keep it coming to y'all. All right, sir. Till next week. Peace. Please welcome to the Slip and Dip podcast, making a Slip and Dip debut. One of the best worldwide Rec- well recognized strength and conditioning coaches <laughs> in the world today. He can get you if you want to get in shape. He's the man to go to. Straight out of Las Vegas, Nevada, Mr. Larry Wade. He trains stars like Sean Porter. Nine stars, champions like Sean Porter, Caleb Plant, and he even trained Mr. KSI himself. Got a shout out last night after he got the win, <laughs> Mr. Larry Wade. Man, appreciate you coming on. I appreciate that, fellas. You know, before I go forward, you know, first let me say thank you, guys, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, one thing I want to do is not leave out someone who's really close to me as well, and that is having uh, Luis Ortiz and also having Badu Jack as well in the stable. So those are two more champions I want to add. I, w- I, w- I wouldn't feel right not adding them to it, you know, based on what we're trying to do right now. Yeah, Badu's my guy. Badu's good. He get in with the show. <laughs> Great people. Definitely. Give us some insight to how serious, because I thought the whole thing was entertaining last night. I was entertained, and I'm somebody that covers boxing for a living. But right, the fact right. that they both took it serious, to me, made it go off. Because if one of them didn't take it serious, it wouldn't have been as entertaining. Well, let me be honest with you. When this was presented to me, I told uh, my, my manager, I was like, nah, I don't think I don't want to do this. And the reason I didn't want to be part of it, because I actually do this for a living with, you know, champions. And so when you take some guys who come off the internet a lot of times, you don't know what you're going to receive. You don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what kind of individuals you're going to run into. But uh, he said, no, nah, this guy, he's taking this thing serious. And he knows you very well. Uh, his trainer, Vidal Riley, who you guys saw working the corner, is also one of my athletes. So I worked with Vidal for a couple of fights, knocks the guys out. And so when Vidal, I talked to Vidal directly and I asked him, this KSI kid, and they don't call him KSI, they call him JJ. And he said, man, JJ's serious. I said, man, are you sure? Because I don't want to connect myself. <laughs> not serious. He said, no, no, no. I'm telling you, he's proper. He's ready. He wants to do this. Okay, so I talked to my manager again. I said, hey, listen, Amir, if I do this, I'm not taking it easy on this kid. 
I'm going to bring it to him like I would bring it to anybody else. He said, no, he'll be fine. So I talked to JJ myself. I talked to him in person. And I asked him, I said, now, listen, are you serious about this? He said, no, man, I'm serious, proper. I want to do this thing. <laughs> proper. I said, listen, you realize I'm not going to take it easy on you. You do realize I'm going to train you the same way I would train anybody else. And the reason I said it in that way is because these guys putting their life on the line as well. We can sit here and make light of it, but when you get in that ring, no headgear, 10-ounce gloves, you can lose your life in there, mm -hmm. right? Anyone else. And so uh, he told me, listen, I don't want you to take it easy on me. Cool, because I'm not going to. And so from that point forward, we had to understand it going in the door. That's legit, man. That's legit, because like you're saying, like uh, the first fight, obviously they, they had the headgear on, and everything and it was really just like an amateur bout just to see who's gonna how many people they can get to tune in and then the right. second time it was like all right let's kind of do this for real and I, like you said the, the training i would assume uh would be a lot different preparing for a fight without headgear on versus with a fight with headgear on maybe i don't know maybe you can speak to that i, I couldn't tell you because the way i look at it i only train professionals everybody i train ain't no headgear on yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm all the same with the same integrity, with the same intentions that I would expect from anyone. I mean, at the end of the day, I personally feel responsible for a boxer's ability to walk in and out that ring. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them have family, some of them have kids. So if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure they're in the best physical shape so they can protect themselves to the utmost ability so they can walk out and get back to their parents, get back to their, their kids and their wives. That's really important to me. Can, can, can you give people some insight on how uh, intense it is? Like, I, I've, I've, been, I've had some behind-the-scenes stuff to see Mr. Wade at work. <laughs> and it's like there's no, like the, like the, like in football, they always say, on the hop, it's like you say on the hop in the workouts. Ain't no idle time in no Larry White workouts. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can't just jump in my workouts and think you're going to survive. That's not how it works. Uh, every time I deal with an athlete, I, I, just like a doctor, I get I do an evaluation. I see what you physically can do from an energy stand, energy system standpoint, from an aerobic, anaerobic standpoint. See how fast you can recover, how fast your heart beats after one minute, testing your ATP system, testing your anaerobic lactic system, testing your aerobic system. And that will give me a general guideline of where you're at from a training standpoint. From that point, I move on with some mobility work, and I also check out your general strength, and that gives me a, a good idea of what a person's disposition is. Disposition meaning some people are leaning more toward aerobic disposition where they can run all day and not have problems. And then some people lean toward the anaerobic disposition where they can sprint all day and not have problems. Well, when you're dealing with an athlete, you don't know what that disposition is. Some things, sometimes you got to train some energy systems more than others. So once I get that guideline, I kind of put together a workout plan or a structure that I think can help each person individually. Just like you go to a doctor, if you got a cold, you tell him what your symptoms are. He kind of guesses based on his education and experience what medicines will help you. Hopefully they do. Hopefully you don't have to go back. But that's kind of how I do it. I break it down based on what I feel like each person needs as an individual, and I create a program just for them. Very cool. Now, now in training, in training uh, a JJ, like you said, uh, KSI, whichever one you want to refer to as, uh, was there ever, like, while you're pushing him, like like you said, did he ever have a moment to where he was like, he kind of wanted to check out for a little bit, or was he always 100% always locked in when he was with you? He was like every other elite boxer. This is why I, I was excited once I started training him. His integrity was 100%. He put 100% of himself into everything he does. Uh, and, and that made me even more excited and proud to be part of the team that this kid really took this thing serious. He worked really hard. He did a lot of the same workouts that you may see some of my elite athletes you know, do. Didn't back off of them. And uh, he, he welcomed it. Now, I'm not going to say it was easy now. not going to say it was easy. But he dogged it out. And if you look at any of the interviews I had leading into it, the thing that you always heard me say was, he got dog in him. And what my job was to try to pull that dog out, he can walk it every day, opposed to walking it every, every other day. And when you saw in that ring, when he had to bite down, he bit down and he got the job done. 
And you heard me say in the corner, if you ever saw me get close to his ear and tell him, I said, I told you, you got that dog. Let it go. Let it go. And that's what he did. Nice, nice. Yeah. As the fight was playing out, like there was a lot of weird things that happened. Like he didn't get credited for that knockdown, which was a knockdown. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then, then the whole knockdown where he got knocked down and then the two points. It's just madness all, all throughout the fight. <laughs> I was in a tank, though. I'll watch it again. <laughs> the lead up to the fight was crazy, too. I mean, it's almost like a soap opera. You see people getting into fights and having arguments and discussions. More than I've ever seen at any fight I've ever been to. Shannon Brace. So, yeah, right, right. When you, when you, when oh, you, you got to it with Shannon? Say that again? You got to it with Shannon? I just had words with him in the, in the first press conference. But, you know, it, was, it wasn't a situation where it was personal. You know, he's, he's a very aggressive person. Yeah. And he's very passionate about what he does. So, you know, it's a, I just happen to be the person in front at the moment. And and I think that happened a few times with you know pe- different people in our camp. Yeah, it's, it's funny because we had him on the show a couple of weeks ago. He and, fired up there, and you know he was talking about how like Logan was going to be a, a real pro boxer like after this, win or lose. I don't I don't know how much he was just trying to hype us up and hype our <laughs> listeners up or whatever have you, but. I mean, I didn't. I didn't see those qualities as the fight played out. I'll just say that much. Like he had next technique in his jab, but he ain't not a fighter. Yeah, got the physique, well, he, got the look. You know, got, got the jab like Kendrick said, but eh, yeah, he's not a fighter. You know. Yeah, well, it boils down to that. Boxing isn't something that's created for everyone, right? And you can you can talk it, but walking it is totally different. I'm not saying he can't be a professional fighter. What I'm saying is it's going to have to be one of those deep down decisions where he's willing to endure whatever comes along with it. It's not going to always be easy. And those are the lessons that amateurs learn on their way up to being professionals. You know, it's, it's difficult for a guy to go from truly not having that type of background to professional boxing and expecting him to be able to have all the fortitude, the knowledge, the experience necessary to compete at that level opposed to coming from, I think he did some wrestling in high school or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, can't go from that to the front of millions of people at Staples Center and expect him to be able to have everything that goes along with that. Yeah. So if he decides he's going to do it, then he, he definitely needs to take it slow, take his time, you know, go back to some four-rounders and get the experience necessary to uh, get there. And And I'm saying that in that way because if you guys know the history of heavyweights, because I think that's the division he's trying to go to, is always, they always mature late. You know, it's never an early, you know, maturation process for them. We're usually in the lower to middle 30s before they're ready to go. He has plenty of time from an age standpoint. Now he needs to go get those years in. Now, now let's fast forward to, to your up and coming fight. I, I, you know, I'll see. I'll be hanging out with you. I got. I got to hit you up. I'll be out there for, yeah. for Ortiz Wilder. I didn't see the first one. I actually didn't even see it live because I was in um, Vegas at a UFC fight the same night. In fact, Matt's like, you know, right. Deontay. He was in it, and I thought he had lost because he wouldn't tell me. What, I didn't want to know what happened. So right. knowing what you know, what happened the first fight. How much would, are you bringing to Luis to help him this fight um, when? That when the when the chips are down on the table, because he's the only person that's took in the ante in the deep waters. I know he had to draw with Fury, but he, it was never like you were worried about him getting put out of there. You worried about in that seventh round him getting yeah. put out of there in the first fight. Well, well let, let me let me be honest with you about this guy. Um, I jumped at the opportunity to work with him. They gave me a call, and it wasn't a matter of oh I don't know. It's like oh yeah I want to deal with this one. This is one I want to do. <laughs> and, and and the reason for because he's a pure boxer, man. This guy has so much talent when it comes to just the skill set of his own. A lot of times, um, heavyweights don't always have the structure, in my opinion. They can throw punches any kind of way, and so if they land, you can get knocked out. You know, so at this level, this guy is one of the more pure boxers in the game. So for me to have an opportunity to, to work with him, I was excited, and me to be able to bring a certain skill set with me that might be able to help him even made it better for me. Uh, I'm going to be very honest with you in this regard. This guy has impressed me. And when I say by impressed, because you don't see it up front, his true athleticism. He's a true athlete. He's done a lot of things in camp that I had to really sit back and say, oh, my God, how does a guy this big 
be able to do some of the things that he's able to do. So I know that night, you know, Deontay's going to have a lot to deal with that night. You know, this guy is ready to fight. He's ready to win. He's excited about the fight. And, and I know Deontay is going to come prepared. No question about it. I know his people. You know, I know Joey, who's actually from Dallas area. Joey Scott, that is. You know, I've been mentoring the kid for a long time and, and been, been in his life for a long time. So I know he's going to bring it to the table. And Deontay's uh, a competitive person to begin with. So it's going to be an amazing fight. It's, everyone's going to definitely get their money's worth. And if it's up to me, I try to bring the best fit and the most talent to the table so that you can be excited, whether it's Sean Porter or whether it's Caleb Plan or whether it's Padu Jack. You're going to get a show. So I'm expecting to see a great fight. How old is Luis? That's the real question. 40. <laughs> <laughs> He's 40 years old. And, I, and you know what? And I'm going to have to roll with it, man, because I can't see too many men able to do what this man could do if he was any older. The guy talented. That's, That's my word. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, so what you're saying is you have not seen a birth certificate. <laughs> I have not. I don't get paid to get birth certificate. I get paid to trade. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll just mess around. I'll just mess but with you. I, I, trust me, I got some, some videos I've been wanting to release for a long time, and I'm hoping they allow me to release them in the next week or two of some of the things we've done together that make you say, wow, this kid, this guy's really – talented from an athlete standpoint so i'm excited how of course y'all didn't get the decision i know you're part of team porter how does oh. how disappointing was that or is exciting the fact that your condition clearly came into that fight thank you sir i appreciate that clearly because all people like because as you know i'm a base out of dallas kept trying to tell people <laughs> i go to the barber shop man who you think gonna win you gonna be there you the expert bro earl gonna have to go to deep waters to win this fight Man, yeah. why are you saying that? I'm the expert. All of a sudden, I don't know what I'm talking right, about. Right, right. I can't say anything about Arrow. And, and I got a little backlash for it, too, because, you know, I'm, a, I'm born and raised in the state of Texas. And, you know, they're like, how are you going to go against Arrow? Like, what do you mean? I got that paycheck. Arrow ain't paying me. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm going to go with my guys. I mean, that's what it is. That's that's the team. That's the family. And, and, and let's be honest. Sean Porter is the one who introduced me to the sport. I got my first world championship with him. So you can guarantee if I'm going to believe in anybody, I'm going to believe in the guy who brought me into the game and the guy that I don't want two or three world titles with. So you can guarantee that I had Sean winning. I know this, this is going to cause a debate to the whole world. I watched it. I watched the video again. And I, it took me some time, though. I'm not going to lie. It took me some time to go back and look at it. And I was looking at it at two rounds at a time. I, I couldn't watch the whole fight at first. And I, I still have Sean at worst of draw. But – you know, at the end of the day, we take that loss for what it is. You know, we're not going to cry about it. We're going to move on to the next opportunity. Do we want to be able to get in there with him early again? Absolutely. Does, does Errol want to get in there? That's still yet to be seen. You know, so um, it was a great fight. I'm proud of Sean, and congratulations to Earl. And hopefully he's healthy. I know he had a car accident recently. You know, by no means do any of us here, whether it's me, myself, or Team Porter, wish anything bad on the young man. We want him to be successful. You know, that's what it's all about. When it comes down to it, it's just boxing. It's us against you, you against us, and that's what we leave it at. That's what makes that promotion so good because you have no even like, like even a little, I won't call it the amateurs. I'm just calling the YouTubers have more mm -hmm. drama than Earl and them, and it was a lot more the lines, you know, with Earl mm -hmm. them without all that extra. Like it's right. funny to be there and see it all, but and sometimes it's not a good look. Well, you, you, when you're dealing with people who don't do it every day, you're gonna get a totally different effect. You know, it's like cooking for the first time. Now, you can cook. I'm sure everybody in that room cook. I'm, I'm being nice by saying everybody in that room cook because I ain't too sure everybody in that room cook. No, we're, 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 we're going we're gonna to say that. Yeah, we're going to roll with that. <laughs> so, you know, you, you cook, and but someone who cooks every day is probably going to do it with a little bit more efficiency. They're going to probably do it with a little bit more professionalism. Mm -hmm. And the food probably going to taste a little better. You know, and, and that's kind of how these guys are. These guys can, they can box, they can fight, you know, but... They don't do it every day. 
You know, they took a moment, took an opportunity to to do it on a platform that, in my opinion, they created. Mm -hmm. And they did it to the best of their ability at that moment. And they were all willing to put everything on the line for it. You know, with these guys like Errol and Sean and and, Badu and Caleb, they've been doing this stuff since they were young. Kids, amateurs, Olympic trials and golden gloves and all that. And, And so... When they get to this level, they're, they're finely tuned machine. Their skill set is amazing. So we have a different level of professionalism, a different level of, of carrying yourself and boxing and, you know, the whole getting your face and, and not being an issue. We, we've done that. You know, a lot of times it may look personal, but and in some cases it is. But in, in, in this particular case with Sean Porter and Arrow, uh, they did what they were supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, and it, it was a great fight, and uh, yeah, like the like the little you know back and forth pre-fight, like it's very respectful. But I liked when they got chippy at times, a little chippy like verbally, like like hey, I'm gonna let you know, like you're not just gonna say something. Right, a little fine the belt, right? a little yeah. fine the belt when you see it, and it yeah. gets everybody turned up a little more. For me, I love it because that means training gets better for me. Yeah. That means I ain't got to push as hard. They're gonna go for it, you know. And and the great thing about the guys that I do train. These guys are so competitive at all times, man. I mean, you, it's no way – it's hard for me to even possibly train any of those guys together because they'll be competing and running each other to the ground and lifting weights to the ceiling's lifted off, you know, because they don't want to beat each other, you know. So I train them all separate for that very reason. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, man. It, the, the results show, man, like 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 you said, like at the top of it, man, like you're, the list of athletes you have – some of the most impressive names in the sport right now, man. You know, so. you know I'm grateful, and, and I never take it for granted. I never take it for granted. I mean, because, you know, at one point I wasn't here. Mm-hmm. You know, now I am. So every opportunity that I get, I, I try to make the best of it. I get 100% toward it. And, and I, once again, I take it personal in the sense where, you know, these guys' lives are in my hand. I never take that lightly. Never. And, and I keep that in the forefront of my mind at all times that, if a kid gets hurt or if a guy goes down, I'm the hardest on myself. Even with Sean's fight, everybody was like, he did such a great job, blah, blah, blah. I'm still looking at that like, okay, what did I do wrong? What could I have done better? You know, and, and I think that's necessary in order for me to make it. I think I have to be that way with every last person that I train. Yeah, one thing I like, um, of course, you have a personal touch, but like you're like fully a part of the team. Like you wear the colors, the matching jumpsuits. Oh, when yeah. it's media day, you suited and booted because you don't usually see trainers suited and booted. <laughs> like you have it down to a T. I like that personal touch right there. I'm like, man, I need to do some business with that man. Well, I appreciate it, man. I'll be honest with you. I try my best to let the team understand that I'm uh, an addition to, right? Lead trainer coach first, whether it's Kenny Porter or, or Justin Gambers with, with Kayla Plant or, or you know, Lou Duval with Badu Jack. You know, whoever the lead trainer is, that's who I follow 100%. I'm in addition to. So in that being said, what I try to let it be understood is that I am part of the team. No matter if I'm with this team this week or that next week, I'm able to adapt and adjust to each trainer and each athlete's personality. And I want them to know that I'm committed and I'm giving 100%. The way that I work with Badu is not the way I work with Caleb. Mm-hmm. The way I address Sean verbally is not the way I address Badu verbally. You know, everyone is different and has a different temperament. Some people can take it. Some people can't. You have to be able to know that. So, for example, I just use two people. If I, if I say something harsh to Sean, Sean can deal with it and like whatever, right? I don't have to do any of that. Not that I have to do anything with Sean either. But if but I don't have to do that with Caleb either. I just tell him, hey, Caleb, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Done. Done. Yeah. You know, that's just how it is. But, but you know, everybody is different. Yeah, that, that's the mark of a great coach right there, like recognizing that. Like, that's what I see, like, amongst, like, the, the top coaches, whether it be boxing or MMA, the ability to adapt to that, yeah. to what you're speaking to right there is key. You know, the, the guys that try to stick, like, with the whole same formula rigid, like, I'm going to coach everybody the same way. Like, no, nah, you guys are going to get stuck in the middle somewhere. <laughs> you're not going to make it. I got an example, and this isn't even with a boxer. When you're in a situation where maybe you're dealing with an athlete whose dad wasn't there or and, or dad was abusive or, you know, whatever the case may be. Well, maybe they're not used to 
a male figure like myself stepping in there and saying something, maybe they need to be spoke to differently. Or maybe you got somebody who wants that person to be there. Dad wasn't there. They want you to be there. You don't know the backgrounds of each individual person. <laughs> has a strong father figure in front of me. So I don't have to be the father figure type. I could be the crazy uncle on the side. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's uh, that's a sign of your role, Team Porter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you don't, I'm, I'm the crazy uncle on the side with the picnic, you know, suit that looked like the tablecloth. That would be, <laughs> you know, that's the difference because he got, he got dad there. And most of my guys do. But if you don't, then it's my job to be whatever role is necessary. Now, let me be clear on this, too, because this is something I think all young trainers need to know. Your job as a strength conditioning coach in, in, a, in a camp or a league camp is this. Whatever needs to be done. Right. Now, I'm saying that because when we go on trips, I'm picking up bags. I'm getting gloves. I'm getting mouthpieces. I'm wiping off floors. I'm tying up shoes. It's whatever needs to happen. You, you, you don't have a job just saying, okay, I'm going to come do my strength conditioning. And I'm going to watch. No, I might have to put on a shield. Maybe I have to catch miss myself. You know, these are all responsibilities to come along with the job, and you have to be ready for that. There's not one time I go to a trip and I'm going to let uh, any of my fighters carry their bags. I'm carrying the bag myself. You just walk. You the, you the champ. That's the job. And before we let you go, what what's one thing that'll happen in the next six months in boxing that you that you see coming behind the scenes that that might be like whoa? Now you finna get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you about to get me in trouble. Uh, I'm interested to see uh, Caleb Plant coming up. There's some there's some interesting things I think happening with him. Uh, with, the, with the most recent situation with Sean Porter and Errol, I'm very interested to see who Sean's going to line up against next. I'm sure the whole world, in the boxing world, will want to see that too. To see who they're going to put in front of him or who's going to be willing to take that fight. You know, that's going to be big. I think we got a, a big show coming up in two weeks that we all want to see what the outcome's going to be with that one. Yeah, I'll be out there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I actually told uh Badu Jack he owes me two belts. So he's gonna be fighting here soon, you know, in December twenty eighth for that title, the WBA title and uh, and also the WBC silver belt belts from what I'm being told. So I need those two. He owed them to me from the last time. And I told him, I said, Brown, you owed it to me. But as you saw, when that man got his head split right down the middle he didn't stop coming. I don't know if you remember that. He got spit to the skull. I saw the skull myself. <laughs> so, and he just kept coming. So, you know what you're dealing with when you get when you get in the ring with a bottle jack. He's going to keep bringing it to you. Even if he can't see, he's going to keep bringing it to you. <laughs> That's wild. That's wild. Well, we look forward to all that, man. And, of course, the, yeah, like you said, the big fight coming up in a couple of weeks. Man, we appreciate mm -hmm. the time. Appreciate, appreciate you coming Larry. on. Thank you, guys. And, and one last thing. You guys are the reason why we even have any true value in what we do because if it wasn't for guys like you, you know, no one would hear us, no one would see us, no one would truly appreciate us the way you guys do. So I'm always grateful when you guys give me an opportunity or anyone like me an opportunity. And for all those trainers who are out there who see this, know this, that it's the job not easy, but you can do it. Make sure you bring your education along with your experience to the table. Be willing to sacrifice to get to where you need to be because you see me here now, but you didn't see me for years in a row where I'm going to the gym for free every day just to try to learn more so I wouldn't damage anybody's career. But that's really, really important. You may see me now with some top guys and, and even possibly making a little money, but what you didn't see was those years when I was doing it for free just so I wouldn't make a mistake, just so I could learn more and how to be efficient for each individual boxer. So put your time in. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid to, to put your, yourself out there and say, I'll do it for free just so I can learn more. And then eventually your value is going to be raised. So don't be afraid of that. That's how I That's how I got put in the game. As a couple of Mr. Larry Way, the trainer Thank of the stars slash champions. I appreciate you guys so much. I have a blessed one. 
Please welcome to the Slip and Dip Podcast, making Slip and Dip debut. One of the best trainers in the MMA game, just one of the best trainers in combat sports world today, Mr. Fawaz Azabi. He trained GSP. He trained William McDonald. He's currently training Kevin Lee, John Robert Whitaker, and John Badesky. I get, I get all your credentials out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, with a couple of errors, but no worries. How are you guys? <laughs> What's um, what's the Bellator guy you trained too? I'm the Bellator guy, uh, Mandel Nalo. Okay, yeah, he's he's a beast. I, I I literally don't watch Bellator. Else, I saw you in the corner. I'm like, oh, I gotta watch him as, as a Fawaz guy. Sure enough, he put the hands on that dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He's the Bellator guy. All uh, right, that's keep, cool. Gotta keep an eye on everything for sure. Yeah, of course. So I guess the big the biggest thing with you uh, recently is um, I guess having Kevin Lee come to you. Um, getting that all hooked up through Joe Rogan and everything, and of course he went out there and had that ridiculous knockout. What's it? What's it been like working with Kevin Lee, man? Because I, that's a guy I've been following his entire career, and I've been interviewing him since damn near day one. It seems like he's great, man. We really hit it off. Uh, you know, we get along. He's a good fit for the gym. He's a very humble guy. He's a sweet guy. Um, he's uh, great in the practice room. He's a hard worker. And uh, that's what I like to see. I also love his team. You know, I love Dewey Cooper, his brother Keith. Uh, these guys are great to work with. So, uh, you know, we're putting it together. We're putting all the pieces together as a team. And uh, I'm really happy to see him win big in his last fight. When, when that kick happened, you didn't see, you said you were the least surprised person in the arena. Everybody was like going <laughs> crazy. I know Kevin was kind of taking the moment in. His corner is going, his, his friends and relatives are going crazy. And you kind of like, that's what we're talking about. Like you kind of knew it was you knew something before we knew something. <laughs> I was really happy, and I say I was just super happy for him. Uh, you know, he had to, coming back off two losses, back to back losses. So I was really happy for him to get a big win, and I really believe he's going to be a world champion. You know, it was just a, it's such a difficult territory, and he's still figuring out his uh, formula, and he's getting better and better. So uh, working real hard with him for six weeks. I really did see him improve, and uh, I really feel that he's uh, figuring out his style uh, more and more. Yeah, it seemed like, um, you know, in, in the in the moment after the knockout, he was very calm. And I know after the fact, he said he just wasn't feeling the celebration. But I think there's more to that. Like, did you, like, kind of, like, work with him on kind of just calming down a little bit? Because he was a guy that, you know, you could see in his walkout. <laughs> just going crazy. <laughs> just going crazy. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I... I just... <laughs> Kevin's a bit of a, you know, he's a, he's a cowboy. He's a bit of a wildcat, you know, in his personality, his fighting style. I've been trying to get him to be a little bit more precise and be more measured. And I feel that even carried over in his celebration. Very cool. Very cool. So, so, so when you look in the put, put, I know you're kind of like a scientist when you're putting all this stuff together. Is Kevin Lee somebody like you like, okay, he's got the talent. He is a potential to be champion. Let me tweak this right here. Let me get this part of the mental game. Let me get this part of the physical game. And you put it together. You drill, drill, drill. Come fight night. Voila. Is that how it go? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a team effort. He, he's putting in a lot of work. You know, he's really in the gym. He's a hard worker. That's what I, what I like most about him. He's putting in a lot of time and energy. And that gives me a lot of time to help him kind of... Uh, um, explore new ways of doing things, you know, because so many fighters fight in different ways and they're successful. You know, I always tell people, Ali fought completely the opposite of Mike Tyson, but they were both really successful. They found what works for them. And I feel like uh, Kevin needs to keep exploring what works for him. And uh, I'm hoping, I'm trying to get him to be more efficient, efficient in his training, efficient in his fighting. And I think we complement each other, you know, because we're, we're a bit opposite in our thinking and we kind of, meet in the middle and it kind of makes for a nice balance now is that is that like your mentality um i guess kind of across the board with your fighters more so to, to, just to focus on that efficiency or is it or are there a couple of guys that you work with where it's like all right we got to amp you up a little bit no yeah exactly some guys are too calculated hmm. some guys are too patient and you need more of that uh you know take a risk uh, roll the dice because what happens if you if you sit there for too long thinking uh, you know, we call it paralysis by analysis. You know, you, you can lo- you can forget the moment. You can you could not pull the trigger. You could wait too long. You could fall behind on a f- in a fight because you're trying to wait for the perfect perfect moment. I've definitely seen that. That's also a problem. You need the right amount of aggression and the right amount of patience. It's a balance. And uh, when you're in there with your opponent, there's a chemistry between the two. There's that to consider. Mm-hmm. But uh, I feel like I have to calibrate the fighters to the optimum level. So d- different fighters start from different points, you know. But efficiency is always key, of, of course. Mm. 
And to, to all our, our listeners out there, if you like this interview like this one with Mr. Farah Sahabi, please click and that subscribe button and ring that bell. Enjoy grow the show. When you hear the name, do you, does it make you? I mean, I met you like five or six years ago, literally in Dallas, and I'm like, man, that's GSP trainer. Is it tripping you out how like far, like just from being tied to GSP and your gym, the success and the champions you built, how y'all came from people like me? I didn't even, I would try stars. Like, what is that? Like six, seven years ago to now, it's like y'all where we're now, Trash Star Gym, owned by Farah Sahabi. Yeah. You know, uh, before the BJ Penn fight, the second the second fight, UFC 94, that's when we had uh, the primetime show and um, it was just massive media coverage. Before that, we were a smaller gym. You know, we're still a, a, quite a big gym, well known in Canada, but weren't necessarily known around the world. When GSP had that breakthrough fight in uh, UFC 94, I really feel that that's when the people started traveling from all over the world to come to TriStar Gym. And that's when TriStar went up a level. You know, uh, that big win, champion versus champion, George winning in such a dominant fashion, I really feel like it really put the gym on the map. And ever since then, that fire has still been burning. That's crazy. That's the first time I saw your gym. Like, any pictures or anything was watching the countdown show. <laughs> I was one of those people. They got me sucked in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so you, you mentioned the name GSP, and that's a name everybody loves to always hear. And it seems like there's always going to be that rumor about him coming back and fighting. And he's like <laughs> a guy that, personally, it's like, I'm cool. I'm cool. I don't need to see him fight again. But, you know, like, if he comes back, of course I'm going to be tuned in. Of course I'm going to be, you know, fanboying out. But what can you tell us? Like, is he a, is he really actually wanting to fight again? Or is it just one of those things to where it's like, all right, if the perfect situation comes along, I'll do it. You know, I hate to talk for the guy. In, in my opinion, the one thing that will pull George back is a mega fight. Mm. Um, I don't think he's interested in being welterweight champion again and defending the belt every three or four months, uh, twice a year even. It would be too much. I don't think he wants to live that lifestyle. Yeah. Would he, would he have the motivation to do another camp for a mega fight, somebody with a mega name? Yes, I think that's a possibility. Does he want to be a champion defending his title over and over again? I think those days are gone. So could it be like a possibility, like, you know, we saw a BMF title created. Can we see GSP return to one so. of these I don't, I don't special even, one-off things? <laughs> I don't even think there needs to be a title. I think if oh, he okay, fought, it could be about 165, just a five-round super fight. I don't like it. You, I don't threw like down, it. you threw that 165. I've never seen GSP go below 170. So is, is, that, right. is, that, is that a certain matchup that y'all looking for at 165? I think it would be a catch weight. I think it would be something that Khabib would be comfortable with because I think Khabib's very big. I think also Khabib would want to take the tech extra 10 pounds. He doesn't have to cut that extra 10 pounds, you know? Um, I think he, he cuts from very high. So him and George would be pretty much the same size, you know? So it wouldn't be too off uh, base to say 165. Hmm. Yeah, that'd be interesting. That'd very. Be very interesting. I would, I would like that a lot. I mean, you know, of course the fans are going to eat that up. Like you said, no title needs to be on the line. And of course, I think, I don't think anybody's also interested in, uh, I think he, GSP did kind of leave a sour taste in everybody's mouth when he's like, all right, I'm going there and beat Bisbing, bye. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and just drop the title again. But I think also like along those lines, some people saw that. I was like, well, I, I think I actually put it in one of my articles one time. I was like, he came through and hit the reset button on the division. It was like, all right. He did, he did. And, you know, he was planning on fighting again, but he had colitis. He was diagnosed with colitis. So, uh, you know, he had to struggle with that for about a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's still taking care of that. You know, he's using fasting as a, as a remedy instead of using a, a prescription drugs. He's followed by Jason Fong, uh, you know, a world-class doctor that uh, specializes in fasting, and he's staying healthy. But uh, he's definitely training, and uh, he's definitely managing this uh, this ailment, and uh, you know he's keeping it at bay. But he's definitely also still in shape, training. Uh, if a mega fight were to be in the horizon, uh, I think it could tempt him. Tell me this, I look at you as a, as an MMA purist. Do you think for somebody to be like that guy, when you're looking at all time greats and the way things are established now, that you you have to do it in more than one weight class? No, I wouldn't if say that. If you want to be the I, GOAT, I should say. If you want to be the GOAT, not an all-time great. I, if you want to be the GOAT. I wouldn't say you have to be in more than one weight class. I think those those uh, those are, are possibility. It's a possibility for sure if you win two weight classes. However, I think you have to dominate your division for many years. Jose Aldo did it. 
GSP did it. Matt Hughes did it. John Jones did it. Uh, Anderson Silva did it. I think you have to dominate your ch- your 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 uh, division for many years. And of course, if you win a title in another division, that also makes a lot of sense. But we have to look at who did you win that other title. Everything is contextual. If you win, if you're a double champ, who did you beat to win that second title? Who did you beat? So, for instance, you know, George is double champ. McGregor is double champ. Uh, who else is there? Uh, BJ Penn won two divisions as well. I mean, there, there are a number of guys. Uh, but man, who did they Nunes. Beat? Amanda <laughs> Nunes. Amanda Nunes. We also have to consider, you know, what's the division? Which division did you beat? Was it the golden age of your division, etc.? How many times did you defend your title? Who? I think you have to go through the the ages and really contextualize it. It's not just how many fights did you win or how long were you champion. Uh, you know, also you have to consider USADA. For me, if you fail the USADA test, you're off the <laughs> you're off the goat list. In my time out, time out, time out. So you you, you eliminated like three people you just named. You know yeah, that, right? sure, sure. You got to be <laughs> off the list. And it's fair. You know, in, in cycling, if you get tested positive, you're banned for life. You're stripped of every accolade. Why is it in MMA you just get a slap on the wrist? You know why? That doesn't make any sense to me. Doesn't make any sense to me. So we're hitting each other. It's a fight. So I think it should be even more strict, strict in MMA. Of course, if there's, a, if there's an issue, if there's a legitimate reason, like for instance, Diaz, you know, there was a contaminated substance, et cetera. Okay, I understand that. But if you're legitimately caught using an uh, enhancement, uh, like for instance, Dillashaw or whatnot, like he's been caught, red-handed. It's over for you. You should never be on the, in my opinion, you should be banned for life. And I know it seems harsh. It's too dangerous, uh, too dangerous of a sport. For us to tolerate such a, such a, you know, uh, such a thing, we should casual. never. People are too casual about that. Yeah, people don't realize. You know, we're hitting people. They're hitting each other in the head. For goodness' sake, you know, there could be long-term problems uh, over the years. In my opinion, if you get flagged and it's legitimate, you should be banned for life. But that's just my opinion. No, I, I agree with you 100, percent man. It, like you said, a lot of people do undervalue that. And the, the funny thing to me is, like, especially when the the Nate Diaz thing happened. Everybody was screaming out, "Oh, f you saw it! What is it? You saw it ever done for anybody? Like done for the sport?" Well, it's like, okay, well, when your favorite fighter gets popped and it is tainted, like, okay, well, think about all these fighters that you know have been forced off of these things that they were doing before just to comply with you saw it. Like we literally see that in some fighters, their physiques have changed drastically. Absolutely. But some people are still out there screaming "F you Sada" just because their favorite fighter got <laughs> got. You know, USADA is not perfect, down. and don't forget, a lot of these supplements that fighters take are not regulated. Yes, they're not regulated. So the guy might be making a supplement, and you know, and also manufacturing illegal drugs and selling that on the black market. You know, his his supplement company might be a, a front, or maybe that's not where all his major income comes from. Whatever the case may be. That's why you got to take certified. If you're a professional athlete, you should take certified supplements. Don't buy anything from a gas station and put it into your system. That's an absurdity. Mm-hmm. If you're making millions of dollars a year, how dare you do that? You know, you, it just doesn't. It, I don't. I don't believe a truly competent, world class athlete would do that to himself. Would chance that to himself. That just makes no sense to me. And uh, if, if for, for instance, you are taking a name brand and it's not certified, and you do get in trouble. USADA will figure it out. They'll go, you claim to be taking those supplements. They're going to go check those supplements, whatever the case may be. But some fighters have been caught red-handed. We know for a fact they were cheating. You know, it's absurd for me. You know, imagine I put, uh, imagine I put uh, uh, something in my glove. Imagine I load my glove and I knock a guy out. And then you guys find out that I had, you know, I had a piece of metal in my glove. What would you think? You would think that's assault. That's a crime. Uh, that's. Well, you know what? Taking steroids is quite similar, in my opinion. It's quite similar. That's why we have a men and men and women's division. What's the difference between men and women? Testosterone. What's the difference between men and women? Women are just as smart, they're just as hardworking, et cetera, et cetera. Testosterone. That's why we need a division. That's why we need division. So, in my opinion, if you're on testosterone and you're fighting somebody on testosterone, okay, it's fair. If you're on testosterone, you're fighting a guy who's not on testosterone. That, in my opinion, is just wrong. That's 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 how I see it. I like it. Yeah. Man for us coming hard to paint. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, man. No doubt. So I mean, what did you think about the whole creation of this title? Because we are like in this this entertainment era. 
so to speak, right? Where it's not necessarily the, the best fighting the best in the marquee spots. I mean, very talented fighters, so to speak, but it's like, you know, we had an opportunity for the UFC to create a 165 pound division and we do a BMF title, <laughs> you know, that's a one off. I, I actually really like the BMF title. I'll tell I, you what. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the, the premise of it because, you know, like in the boxing world where they do all these random belts just for fun, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. I, I didn't mind it. <laughs> But, You're doing a pay-per-view. Yeah. And there's got to be something on the line. Now, originally, it was supposed to be Usman and uh, uh, Kobe, right? right? Yeah. And I, I think that's a great fight. But maybe there was, from what I understand, there was negotiation issues. Like, I don't know any details. I don't, want, I, I don't even want to speculate on details. But they're like, hey, if we can't get these two guys in the ring together, in the octagon together, let's do another title, BMF. You know what? It was a great substitute. Why? Imagine, for instance, uh, Ferguson beats Khabib. Imagine, for instance, okay, or Khabib beats Ferguson or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can do a 165 BMF, Masvidal versus Ferguson. Or Masvidal versus... You can move that title around. It's not an official title. True. You can make a 165 between two champions or two uh, ranked guys from two different divisions, and there's something on the line. When you have a pay-per-view show, there's got to be something on the line. That's what fans like to see. That BMF title can exchange hands now. And, of course, that BMF, you have to have a certain type of attitude to fight for that title, right? So, a Ferguson versus Masvidal. <laughs> even, even if Masvidal, even if Ferguson loses to Khabib, you could do Ferguson versus Masvidal, 165. That's something I would love to see. You have different mashups that you can make. And you have fighters that are not judge-friendly. Let's, let's call it what it is. The <laughs> BMF so fighters are not judge-friendly. They just want to get in there and fight. The fans love it. You can do catch weights. I love it. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, tell me, how much of that you, you kind of alluded to it, the entertainment aspect? Because like, um, we're kind of different. Did you um, you watch boxing? Yeah, yeah, I do. Did you, did you, did you, I don't you think about the, these days, but I do. What do you think about the, the YouTube fight that they had on last night? Oh, the KSI. Yeah. Uh, I watched. I watched. <laughs> I watched the first fight, KSI and Logan. I really liked it. I watched only the highlight. I thought it was tonight because I believe the last time they did it, it was on a Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was glad watching it tonight, but I now I remember it was on the zone. They put it on the zone. Yeah. So uh, listen, I think it's great. Why the hype was great. The fans want to see it. They actually boxed pretty well. I saw the highlights uh, on YouTube today. <laughs> I saw that KSI won it. Congratulations to KSI. Listen, I would love to uh, train one of those guys. I, I, I like it. I like this YouTube boxing. There's a lot of interesting personalities can, that can get in there, mix it up. There's big money behind it. That means the fans love it. I, 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 if the fans I, 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 love it, yeah, yeah. if the fans love it, why not? You know, why not? Yeah, like, See, I, like, I, 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 tell him. <laughs> like, like I said last night, somebody threw the question out on Twitter. They were like, you know, it was like a poll. It was like, do you prefer, you know, the top tier opponents facing top tier opponents or do you like the entertainment stuff? And my reply was like, nine times out of ten, I want to see the best fighting the best, but I don't mind going to the circus once a year, you know? Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> and, and, and the truth of the matter is those guys are brilliant at building up fights. I heard they made four million a piece each last the first fight. Hey, so, I mean, there's a demand, you know, and you got to give the people what they want to see. And I think there's a place for YouTube boxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. You, you think they have a YouTube MMA? You think you think somebody can capitalize off that? I believe so. I believe so. I think we should we should start that actually. We should find a find a good place and make it happen. Well, Logan would be one of the, Logan Paul would be one of those guys because he can't wrestle. Why not? I've heard. Yeah, he's a wrestler. That's right. But uh, you, you touched on something I want to also. I was also wanting to ask you at some point. Um, you said you wanted to train one of those guys. Like who who in the MMA game already at one of the top tiers? You know, whether it be in the UFC or another promotion, is a guy that you would like to train. I know some coaches won't want to say it outright because it's like kind of uh, stepping on other coaches, but, you know. Ray has just suffered a loss. I think I could really help him. I think he's a phenomenal um, phenomenal athlete. I think he's uh, a, a good candidate for me to work with. I think he just needs more guidance. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. What do you think also, like, because, like, when Josh Star came around, it was kind of like y'all and Jackson's, and now you got the ATT and the uh, Alpha Male, and then and here in Dallas, we're, we're close to good old Fortis. My man here training, he made, he made, he making him supporters. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys, my, my apologies. I misspoke. Uh, I meant uh, Johnny Walker, not oh, the. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Reyes recently just won his fight. I apologize. I was talking about, I was thinking Johnny Walker. I think he's a raw talent, and I think uh, he just needs some guidance. 
So hopefully, uh, me and him are going to connect soon. Gotcha. Sorry, what was your second question? Uh, what do you think about these gyms? Like I said, y'all, because you're original, you and um, uh, Week John, y'all like the originals. And now you got ATT, now you got Alpha yeah. Man. Now here in Dallas, we got good old Fortis. What do you think about these gyms that are popping up and how they're growing the sport? The sport is growing. You know, the sport is growing, and so will the the gyms and the demand for uh, training and for. Uh, for everything. There's going to be more gyms. MMA, Jiu-Jitsu is the sport of the future. Combat sports, uh, it's not going away. So uh, it's normal that the, the, the market is growing. There's going to be more and more Jiu-Jitsu. There's going to be more and more MMA. There's going to be more and more kickboxing. So it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Think, think of how many shows we're having in the last few years. We've been having like 50 shows a year. Add Bellator. Add the PFL now. Add uh, one, one FC is such an amazing show. There's so many great shows to watch every weekend. L- L- KSW is on the map now. I mean, there's so many great shows. I was in Europe for a KSW. There was a KSW last night. Amazing shows, man. Incredible fight. So it's just, just this thing's not going away. I expect it to grow even more. Hey, one's starting to win me over. I want to see them come to North America. <laughs> Absolutely. They're, they're going to be all over the place. You know, this, this sport's it's growing. There's going to be more and more shows. Uh, they just opened up a UFC uh, a facility, a PI, a Performance Institute, in China. And I heard it's bigger than the one in Vegas. I heard it's three times bigger than the one in Vegas. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, UFC has its first Chinese champion. This sport is growing, man. It's growing in Asia. It's growing all over the world. Uh, I mean, this, in my opinion, look, you guys might think I'm crazy, but I think MMA is going to be as big as NFL one day. Wow. It's going to be that right. big. I would hope so. First fight in UFC, one million dollars. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. I think the sport is gonna grow that far. I hope so. You're gonna I have know. rookie rookies, rookie guys. You know the rookie year in UFC, so to speak, making multi-million dollar deals, uh, mega fights like like May- Mayweather does. Like, it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna happen. <laughs> what what thing that um I I trip out on is how can people having grass like. If you if like being a mixed martial artist, you have to be a mixed martial artist. You can't just be the specialist in 2019 if you think you're gonna be a champion. Yeah, you definitely have to come in well rounded, but you also at the same time. I know it sounds weird, but you have to be a specialist in something. You have to be the best at one thing, better than everybody else. You have to be well rounded because, I mean, if you're the best boxer, but you're really, really, really weak on the ground, you're never gonna get to use your boxing. So you got to be well rounded. That's the base. But then you got to be extremely good at one thing. So, for instance, if you look at Kobe Covington, he's great everywhere, but he's the best at wrestling. He's the best. So, you know, you look at, uh, you know, uh, John Jones, for instance, you know, he's really good everywhere, but he's the best at striking. Like, he always wins the striking exchanges. You know, at the end, he comes out on top in that area. You have to be well-rounded, but then at the end, you have to put that cherry on top, that cherry on top. you got to have a strength. If you want to be champion, there's one thing you got to do better than everybody else in your division. So you got Usman and Covington. Uh, that's a great fight. I'm really looking forward to this fight. Uh, not because of all the, the hype and all that, but just because I love to see a fight where I don't know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah. feel like this fight can go either way. That's what makes me like, wow, I got to see this fight. And uh, listen, I'm going to pick Usman. But I'm telling you, if he wins, I, in my opinion, it's by a hair. He's going to back in three rounds, but it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a, an incredible battle. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I love the matchup. And, you know, for me personally, like, it's unfortunate Colby Covington went with this whole gimmick that he's doing because <laughs> you know, I, I was a fan of him, uh, of his fighting style before he started that. And then it's like, all right, you, you're making it kind of hard now, guy. <laughs> but, no, he's still he's still a phenomenal uh, fighter inside the cage. And he is. He's a phenomenal tomorrow. fighter. Yeah. But, you know, what? the average fan – the, the truth of the matter is, you know, we, we, have a, we have a different culture in MMA. In boxing, they take a guy like Kobe, and they know he's, he, he's above average. They know he's amazing. Okay? They know he's an, a, a 1% fighter. You know, he's in the top, top, top 1%. They show, the whole, they show the public how good he is. They bring him a guy who's a 500 fighter. They let him beat him up. They build him up to a, to a mega fight. They give him 10 wins in a row. Then they take another fighter that they build up, and then they have a mega fight. So you have two guys in the 1%, and they're having this mega fight. And the fans know now. Why? Because they saw them beat up 10 other guys. Whereas in UFC, it's totally different. In UFC, they take two really tough fighters, and they pin them against one another. Yes. Well, what happens when you take two elite fighters, you, you don't know that they're that good. 
they look average because they're nullifying each other. So, for instance, if I show you a fight between, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, two really, 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 like, for instance, if you saw RDA versus Tony Ferguson, we all love that fight because we've seen RDA and Tony Ferguson bust off through the division. But if that was the first time you saw those two guys fight, you'd be like, look, they're good, but they're not great. Right. And the reason you would be under that impression is because the fight was close, but they were nullifying each other's tactics. Where if I put you, if I put Tony Ferguson or RDA with an average Joe, you're going to be like, wow, that guy's amazing. Because the contrast is so vivid. So I, boxing will give you that contrast over and over again until you're convinced that that guy's one of the best ever. And then they'll pin him against another superstar. Yeah. So that's why the UFC is much harder territory to build a star. 100%. 100%. And I think that's also, um, to kind of expand on that, why I think some MMA guys don't get as much credit compared to boxers. Because like you were saying, like on the buildup, a lot of boxers get a lot of easy <laughs> a lot of easy walks up the ladder, so to speak. Whereas that's in, true. In, in, in MMA, you don't. Not in the UFC, you don't. <laughs> you don't. You don't. That's true. I think it makes sense. I think it does make sense. I don't think we have to go as far as boxing. Sometimes you have a world champion fighting a can. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have to go that far. But I think there, we have to build, for the future of the sport, we have to build megastars. The more megastars there is, the more people tune in. The more people tune in, the more, the, the, you know, the more stars there are, the more, money, the more money that comes in. So it, that's good for everyone. Would you, would you be on board with, you know, in the UFC, with guys who have been on a year or two year layoffs, would you be on board with those guys coming back and facer facing like an unranked opponent? You know, because like if, GS yeah. if GSP comes back, GSP is in a title fight type fight. You know, <laughs> yeah, Versus it's called a tune-up fight. Yeah, I yeah. agree totally. It makes sense. For sure. Um, I think it does make sense, but maybe logistically, I don't know what behind the scenes that paper views on. I don't know if it makes sense for them in terms of you know paying GSP and giving them a tune-up fight. I don't know if that makes sense. Right. However, I think they, if you have to do something that does make sense. Um, I think there are some fighters when they come back in boxing, they do take tune-up fight. Mm -hmm. They do. It's a, it's a fact. Oh, 100%. And then they take on a mega fight. Like, for instance, I remember <laughs> I remember when Mike Tyson fought Lennox Lewis. He was saying, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I need one or two more tune-up fights. And they didn't give it to him. And I truly believed, to, like, when I watched his fight with, with Lennox, I felt he was off. And I felt he was right. He needed. He said it again after the fight. You know, um, I think I think his career could have been very different. If he did take those, if he insisted on those tune-up fights, yeah. Uh, a, a great example is Bernard Hopkins. He insisted on tune-up fights, and he got tune-up fights, and he did go on to become world champion. So, I mean, there, there's so many, there's so many examples to draw on in boxing because boxing's been around forever. I mean, was wasn't Andy Ruiz supposed to be a tune-up fight for Anthony Joshua? That's a good point. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it does go the other way. Hey, you know what? If I was a tune-up fight for a megastar. And I would take it because I believe I can win. I can make my name overnight. That's, that's, what, that's what's in it for the tune-up guy, the supposed tune-up guy. I'm going there thinking these guys calculated it wrong. Yeah. Exactly what he did. I, I'm ready for the rematch. You go watch the rematch. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. 100%. Mexican Rocky, man. I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, man. Anybody hating on that story, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with you. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> Gotta love it. Exactly. Yeah, man. Well, for us, man, we, we appreciate your time coming on and joining us for the first time on the Slip and Dip podcast. I, I love your insight. I watch you on your YouTube channel, you know, giving the breakdowns all the time as well. So uh, I appreciate your insight. You, you should have your own detail, man, for real. They should get you your detail on ESPN. Right, yes. So you can make some extra money. Oh, that would be fun. And, and tell them to Slip and Dip threw that out there. We stick <laughs> it to awesome. five for six, six. I five. appreciate that. Thank you, boys. <laughs> for sure. If they call me, I'm answering. <laughs> awesome, appreciate boys. it brother appreciate it boys please welcome to the Slip and Dip podcast making his Slip and Dip debut Miguel El Michicano Flores see I know I was bilingual <laughs> he'll, be t he'll be taking on Leo Santa Cruz for the featherweight the vacant WBA featherweight belt on the co-main of the Ortiz my bad Wilder Ortiz 2 car in Las Vegas I'll be there ringside man thanks for coming on Definitely. Thank you guys for having me on. Thank you for the opportunity to showcase me. I, I, we talked to uh, a couple about now, more than a couple weeks, about a month and a half ago in LA, and it's kind of crazy because like we're sitting there having a full fledged conversation, and everybody's focused on Leo Santa Cruz. How, the, how, how excited are you to, to have your your Mexican Rocky slash Luis <laughs> Ruiz type moment? 
No, that's all good to me. I mean, let him have all the all the all the pressure on him. That's fine with me. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a live underdog, so uh, that's all I'm worried about. You know, I, I know I got to train hard for for this type of fight. So while he's doing interviews and having all these other things he has to do, you know, I'm in the gym, busy training and running. Yeah. So what's gonna take to get the job done? Did you did, did you like watch the Frampton fight, or do you just kind of take it because your your style's completely different than his? No, I mean. I've grown up watching Leo Santa Cruz. You know, I've known his family for for many years. His brothers fought a few times down here in in Houston, and I always knew them because they're from the same hometown, Dragan. So I always follow their career, his career, and I mean, he's a great fighter, three division world champion. He hasn't accomplished everything he had just because you know he's a good fighter. Because that means he's a great fighter. But uh, obviously, you know, we can't just uh, go in there thinking, oh, it's going to be an easy type of fight. I know I got to be ready to either box all 12 rounds or brawl with him all 12 rounds. You know, of course, I, um, I have a game plan that I that I need to uh, do that night. And if that game plan doesn't work, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready for a brawl. 100%. So what's been like the, the mindset for you? Um, it, you? You had a disappointing 2017 but like, what's different from you now? Because you rebound with two TKOs. Now you got a big name on the resume coming up next. Like, probably, I, I don't. Know, I think most people say your biggest fight, obviously. But you know, like, how do you? Or I guess what's been the difference between that 2017 version of you versus the 2018, 2019 version of you? Well, that's the good. That's the great thing about boxing that every day that goes by in the gym, you just keep learning. And obviously, uh, I learned a lot from mainly from the first defeat with a. Uh, that win you know that defeat i learned a lot there's some things i can't do during fights and just experience you know the second fight that i lost with uh chris avalos i, I was dominating that fight i had dropped chris avalos i was up on all four cards it was just a bad call by the ref but you know it's still you know you take all those like uh, uh fights as, as learning experiences and you use them in the gym as well you know every every day has been uh two years since, since those losses and I'm growing as a fighter, maturing as a fighter, and obviously there's things that uh, I, I needed to work on, you know, from those fights, and we've been fixing those mistakes, you know, those little bad habits that we have, keeping it tight, and, and we know we need to be 100% or better for this type of fight. Obviously, it is the biggest fight of my career, but like I said before, I've been around this um, I've been around this level all my life. You know, it's not like I'm put here from one night to the other. My brother fought, you know, at the MGM. I've been around the big stages, so I know what it's like. You know, it's nothing new to me. But like I said, I know Leo's a tough, tough guy, and I have to be ready. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. Does the stage at all like worry you at all, or is it just like one of those things where you look forward to being in this big spot? Um, I look forward to it. Obviously, there is some nerves. You know, there is a lot of mixed emotions. But uh, you know, I I know I'm the type of fighter that rises to the occasion. You know, I've always proved that in my career. Every time, you know, I get I get on the bigger stage, I'll rise to the occasion. So I'm ready for that. You know, I, I enjoy doing all this stuff, you know, the, the media, the stuff, the, it, it, whatever comes with it, I enjoy doing it. And it's not going to be nothing new. You know, as a fighter, you already know how to fight. You know, it's just about triggering your mind and, and mentally preparing yourself to know that you're ready for that night. How you how you plan on dealing with that world renowned pressure that may, that made Leo Santa Cruz a multi time world champion in a future Hall of Fame type fighter? Yeah, well, um, even though uh, Leo's a great fighter, there there is no secret to his style. Um, we all know that he likes to throw punches and bunches, and he tires with all all his pressure. And uh, basically, he gets hit with one good shot, and he wants to get it back right away. And, you know, he just basically, uh, like you say, he has balls. You know, he likes to come and fight. And fight. <laughs> so I know I have to be ready for that. And uh, my career, if you ask anybody, that's what I'm known for, too, coming forward and fighting. Um, we are trying to, you know, like I said, fix uh, small things in this training camp. For example, box. When we win a box, a lot of people don't realize how good, you know, my feet are, how good of a jab I have. So, of course, I'm going to try to use all that. I got some tricks under my sleeve as well. You know, um, I can be I can be a veteran. I can be crafty in there. So, I, I need to do that and let Leo know from the first round, you know, this is your ordinary type of fighter. You know, we're going to box when I want to and we're going to fight when I want to. Do you have the power to drop him? Because a lot of people seem to be underestimating your power. Yeah. I, I, I've, trust me, as a fighter, you always picture, 
uh, or, or play the fight over in your brain again and again. And trust me, I picture myself dropping Leo, maybe not with a headshot, but with a body shot. You know, I, ha I have, you know, that's one thing I, I noticed. I've been, you know, hurting my opponents with uh, for this camp with body shots. And trust me, I'm going to say it. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if I hurt him with, with a body shot. I know he throws great body shots as well, but. You know, nobody likes body shots, so I'm not gonna land. A, if I land a good body shot, you know, I may be able to drop them. Nice, nice. Now, as, as you're training for like a big fight like this, like how how often are you paying attention to everything else going into the boxing world? You know, are you still watching like every fight to, all every weekend, or are you just kind of trying to shut off away from that, like outside of training? You know, now that you mentioned that. Um... There's been fights back to back, you know, all these weekends, and and you know, when once you're in this deep into camp, there is a point where you just get tired of boxing, you know, you because you're training two three times a day, you're you're going to the gym for two three hours, and you're just you know you're in that mode where you're doing it because you have to, and uh, when there's fights, sometimes trust me, I'll doze off, I'll wander off, and and if, unless it's a real good action packed fight, you know, I'll be real into it. But right now, you know, I'm just trying to. Sometimes uh, it's good to keep your mind off of, off of the fight. Don't put too too much pressure on yourself. But at the end of the day, you know the first thing you think of when you wake up is the fight. You know the first thing uh, that comes to mind. Uh, oh, I got to fight with Leo Santa Cruz in a few months or a few weeks. And the first and the last thing you think of when you go to sleep is Leo Santa Cruz. So trust me, I'm thinking about him almost 24 seven. Of course, you motivate. This is the biggest opportunity in your life. Do you think in a fight like this, it would it would it would benefit you to kind of have a little extra edge? Like if there was some go back and forth, like it's been very peaceful, calm. It's none of that 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 Mexican machismo that you see sometimes in fights well, on this stage. Sometimes the the best fights are, are you know the guys that come in quietly that make no noise. Those are the those are the the, the you know the guys that give you the best fights. And uh, you know I respect Leo. I respect Leo outside the ring. I, I respect his accomplishments. But inside the ring, you know I, I'm definitely. You know, there's no friends in the ring. Uh, you know ever since I was I was a young boy. You know my brother, my father always taught me there's no friends in the ring. So you know outside the ring, all respect to him. Inside, I'm trying to knock him out for sure. But like you say, I mean, we're not those type of fighters, you know, uh, throughout our whole career. He's always been, you know, real, even after what uh, Gary Russell did to him, it ain't even like, <laughs> you know, bump him off or anything. He's just a chill guy. And I mean, that's what you got to do. Uh, I, sometimes I don't understand the guys that get all hyped up at the weigh-ins and all like, you're going to have the guy tomorrow for, for 12 rounds. And, you know, you could do whatever you got to do in there. And then once fight comes, they don't do nothing. I'm like, okay, so what was all that energy you had before the fight, you know? So that's the type of fighter I am. You know, I, I'd rather save all that energy for the fight, for the, you know, I know I'm going to have him 12 rounds in front of me for three minutes. That's, that's you know, that's when I want to knock him out. That's when I want to, you know, uh, put some hurt on him. Let me put the, on the pain. <laughs> yeah. Like, the funny thing to me, like, when, you know, guys have that animosity and everything is, like, immediately after the fight, they're still trying to push and shove. Like, bro, yeah, yeah, y'all just went 12 rounds. Like, yeah, y'all had all that time. <laughs> exactly. You just had him in front of you, and you didn't do nothing. You know, that's when you want to do it, you know. And I think people respect that more. Uh, a lot of people say, like, oh, they're trying to sell the fight. Yeah, well, you know, to me, we're two Mexican warriors. You know, this fight don't need to sell. Like I said, we're going to prove uh, what we're made of in the fight. And trust me, after the fight, people are going to be, you know, saying, okay, that was a great fight. You know, we want to maybe see a... Flores Santa Cruz too, you know, they'll be asking for a rematch. Here's a two part question. One, does it bother you that they basically bring you in to to lose? They like, oh, we picking him because we don't think he's a threat. And two, how big a deal is it to get started off? As you know, Leo is a very fast starter. How big a deal is to you get yourself off to a fast start on cards and just to get his attention off the bat? You can't like wait to the fourth or fifth round. Yeah, well, uh for your first question, I mean better for me that people don't expect anything from me um because at the end of the day if i lose okay he was supposed to lose but if i win you know it's it's the big upset of the year so it's better for me you know uh i hope he's thinking like okay i'm gonna have an easy night i hope you know he's worried about uh the the, the gary russell the tank davis i hope he's thinking about them I, i'm cool with that uh, i hope the media always talks about them when they interview you i'm fine with that you know i, I want to be the least person he's worried about why because you know, that, that tells you that he's overlooking me. 
So, um, but at the end of the day, I know Leo is a professional. Uh, his father, his he has a great team. His father, his brothers, I know they're not looking past me. They know what I can do, and they they've watched videos on me because he said it repeatedly, and they know what I'm capable of doing. So he's not overlooking me. But um, like you say, I'll 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 take the underdog role any day. That's no that's no um new thing to me. Um, for your second question, I mean it's you can say. To be in this position, it's it's very nothing. I mean, I don't know how to explain it, but it's not like I was here overnight. You know, I've been working my butt off for for many many um, years, and I'm, I wasn't here overnight. You know, I know what it takes. My brother, he always told me I was gonna be in this position, and I never kind of believed him. You know, I was always like, man, why are you talking like that? Like, why are you always? And obviously, he sent something. So it's here, and I'm planning to take full full advantage of it. Very cool, man. Very cool. Yeah, man. I like I like your attitude, man, because it's like you know some people they seem like it's like all right, yeah. Some people like kind of all like check out, like in a, in a way, so to speak. Like yeah, they're gonna show up and still compete. But sometimes, like when you talk to some people that are quote unquote brought in to lose, like they have that mentality, like where right, I'm just getting my paycheck, go home. Like I'm not getting that vibe from you. <laughs> no, well, obviously not. I want more, you know. Yeah. Uh, trust me, I saw the numbers on the rematch clause, and and those numbers look way better than for this fight. <laughs> numbers for this fight. I want the numbers on the rematch clause, so that's motivation. Obviously, you don't want to look too further ahead, but I mean, if if money isn't motivation, then I don't know what is. You know, I can basically uh, change my whole family's life around, and I've told myself like, there's days I don't want to do it. There's some days I'm tired. I'm like, man, you know, this tough day of sparring now i gotta go to strength and conditioning now i gotta go run but i'm like hey uh i may only have this opportunity once and i gotta make the best of it you know i can't i can't let it pass by um I, actually two because uh you know the first fight was uh obviously canceled because of my foot injury so i'm mm -hmm. getting this opportunity twice you know so i'm like man i'm very blessed you know i have a good team if they got this opportunity for me twice yeah 100 percent, man 100 percent. so what what's something that that you know, I guess the the general public or the fans may not know about you. Like, what what's something that you do? You know, to kick back, relax. You know, outside of the boxing thing. Like, what's what's your what's your thing? Um, I I, I like riding horses. Uh, I got a few. <laughs> uh, I'm Mexican. Like I said, I come from from uh, the state of Michoacan in Mexico, and over there, you know, we're known for for just horse riding and stuff like that. I got my own horses. Uh, my Caro. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, um. Not the type of horses like Canelo got. He got some dancing horses that are late. <laughs> you no, know, different. But uh, you know that that's just maybe one day I'm able to buy a horse like that. But uh, yeah, that's that's what I do with my free time. Spend time with my kids. Take them out there. One of my kids loves being out there. So you know now um, I'm not. I'm I'm a little older now. I'm a family man now. No. Back then I was probably you know out and about. Now it's more about the family. And now I got kids to. To look after and i know they're looking they're looking at me and you know i got to set a good example for them oh man well man best of luck come to you uh in just a couple weeks time here biggest fight in career uh big big opportunity for you and your family man best of luck to get this yeah. job done and come home with a belt definitely i mean like i said uh a lot of fighters never get to fight for a world title they don't they don't you know they don't get to the to this stage and it, it's crazy because uh a lot of fighters dream is to obviously fight in vegas and uh, I'm doing it. I get to fight in Vegas for the first time for my world title. So it be a great, great uh, way to do it, to win my first world title in Vegas. And like I said, I know it's not going to be an easy, easy task. But uh, so I've said, Leo, I got a few tricks under my sleeve that we're working on. And we're going to we're gonna do a great. Yeah. Not just in Vegas, but at the MGM Grand, man. Like, there's a lot of history in that building, too. Exactly. Exactly. I, lo I love that venue. Hey the big stage and we're ready to sink it all sink it all in um i mean and and imagine i mean beating the guy leo's been the guy for for many years you know for over 10 years he's been that guy and i think it's time for a for a new champion and a new face in the, in the boxing i think a lot of people are getting fed up with leo um i think it's time for a new champion to step up and you know dethrone him there he is guys miguel flores getting ready to take on leo santa cruz on the 23rd be sure to tune in it's gonna be a hell of a fight and hell of a fight card as well so Man, we appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate brother. it, brother. Definitely. Thank you guys for having me on, and you guys have a good night. Please welcome back to the Slip It Dead podcast.
fresh off of two fresh victories, with trainer of Joanna Janjacek and the new BMF of UFC, Jorge <laughs> Masvidal, <laughs> Mr. Mike Brown. You had your hands in a lot of pots full of gold lately. <laughs> man, yeah, it's the ch- the team has been killing it, man. Uh, yeah, good, it's good to be an American top team. I'll tell you that. Hundred percent, hundred percent, man. What, what's been the what's been the uh, I guess the most impressive? Not I don't know if impressive or I guess like your favorite moment over the past month. Because like like Kendrick just said, like there's been a lot of big victories for you guys. I mean, hell yeah, the winner of a created title that didn't exist before <laughs> is, is is at the gym now. So like you know, how did you guys? What did you uh, think of all that madness? I mean, it's been a great year. Obviously, like uh, Dustin Poirier winning the interim belt. Uh, Kyoji Horiguchi winning the Rise and the yeah. the Bellator title, but uh, I think Masvidal's run this year has been pretty damn incredible. Uh, Till Askren and now Diaz, that's got to be the, uh, the the cherry on top. You know that he's had the greatest year of, of them all. He yeah, got my vote for fight of the year. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, he's he's definitely he's definitely. Um having this like this resurgence that's like almost you know un, un, unheard of <laughs> so to speak right it's, it's like he's riding this wave uh, I'm just curious did you guys you know notice that like hey he's, he's really starting to hit a different stride now like let, let's let's capitalize on this wave as best we can yeah three finishes over over three guys who I mean how many till had been finished once mm-hmm. right? Flattened him. Askren never had never lost. And what about Diaz? Has you know has he ever been finished? I don't know. I don't think so, right? Eddie, no, so certainly, certainly not stopped by by cuts like that. <laughs> no, so I mean this is pretty damn impressive, you know. Who, whose call was it? The fake the need to start off with that? Was that just for show? He just pulled that off the rip. No, man, he was coming with something, man. You don't know what he's coming with. He <laughs> he has something. Every fight, he's coming with something. You just don't know what he's coming with. I don't think it was there what he wanted, but yeah, so he yeah, backed yeah, off. Yeah. But you, but he's coming with something. Is that going to be his thing now? Like every fight, he's going to try to get something wild right off the bat to kind of get the fans know. going. <laughs> it worked a couple times, right? Um, yeah. yeah, but it was funny, dude. The way he ran at him and Nate, like the way he moved, it reminded me like. <laughs> When you step in front of a car or something and it, and it scares you, like, whoa, you know, like, it was pretty wild. You're like, damn, that was, that's crazy, man. The, the, uh, so what do you think about the hands behind the back? Is that just him being Jorge? Because it seems like he, like, does that to kind of, like, sedate the opponent. Like, hey, I, I'm nonviolent. I got my hands behind my back. Wah, wah, like he did um, uh, Leon Edwards. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, man. He's crazy. I don't know what he's thinking. You know? he's like, we don't tell him to do that. That's just him doing his thing. I don't know. It's not like I'm, I don't say like, hey, put your hands behind your back before you start the fight. You know, that's all him, 100%. Yeah, yeah. you got to show up that. Just got to show up that personality, man. Like, uh, he's definitely one of those guys um, that, that really connect to the people in a way. I mean, obviously, like, that's what the whole – premise of the BMF thing was about, right? He's got this unique personality that connects with a lot of people. He goes in there and always gives it his all. You know, he's a guy that, like like he always said in, in those lead-ups, where it was like, that was one of my favorite quotes in the, in, the, um, in the promo videos, where he was like, I was the king of split decisions. And he's like, why am I thinking like a peasant? I'm gonna just start knocking these dudes out. <laughs> like, no, I love that quote that he said. I love it. And, it, and that's what's been showing recently. He's amazing on the mic, man. Honestly, I can't believe they never gave him the mic earlier, right? And he's so good. He's so good on on the mic. He's just, uh, and it's easy for him because he's just himself. He's real, you know. All he has, to, just being himself. He's he, it, it, everybody loves to hear him. So it's so easy. I, I know you you're focused on your fighting and stuff, but what about the ambiance, like with the rock coming out to his theme song and all that stuff? How cool was there to be in the arena for all that? Yeah, I mean, the fight is the. I mean, the fight is the focus, and the fu- and and winning and beating this guy is everything. Everything else is like a bonus, you know. Mm-hmm. So like the money is the bonus, the the belt's the bonus, rock is the bonus. You know, everything else is kind of cool, but I mean, at the end of the day, 
you're there for one thing and one thing alone is to beat this guy, you know. And uh, once the, the mission is accomplished, you're just like, uh, it's a bonus. It's, everything's a bonus to me, you know. <laughs> a bonus to him too, you know. Like, wow, all right, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool, whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, switching gears a little bit, the next big fight, I, I guess the biggest next fight for you guys um, coming up is going to be that, that Covington Usman fight. Um, obviously, like there's a lot of heat <laughs> between these two gentlemen. Um, so, you know, obviously, I, I know Col- Colby I, puts in the work, you know, despite like the whole gimmick that he's doing, where a lot of people are kind of discrediting what he does inside the cage because he is a phenomenal athlete. So I'm just curious, um, what's he been looking like in preparation for this? Uh, I mean, he's a great fighter, but honestly, I have I, I'm not involved with his camps at this time. Um, okay. On the same date, we have Amanda Nunes, yes. the female, the female goat, is uh, also <laughs> yes, defending yes. her title. So <laughs> the quote, I'll, I'll be, I'll be involved with that fight, but I won't, I won't be uh, involved with Colby's fight. He, he's a great fighter, and uh, you know, I, I honestly expect him to win that fight. Okay, yeah, I, that was gonna be my next. I was gonna hop over to Amanda next, but hey, since you since you did it, um, I mean the 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 quote, the the two division champ. Um, some people are saying it's kind of disrespectful to have her <laughs> where she is on the card. I don't I don't know how you guys feel about that or if that's even a thing that you guys think about. Um, do do you, do you guys care about where she is on the card? I don't know. I don't. I mean, I never think about stuff like that. You know, I, at the end of the day, you know, uh, I mean, now my job is the coach. You know, when I was a fighter, my job was a fighter. You know, I wasn't the promoter. Promo- promoter's job is to promote. Fighter's job is to fight. Coach's job is to coach. You know, and uh, that's what my job is now. So that's that's not that's above my pay grade. You know, <laughs> how, how, there's a two part question for Amanda about Amanda. How many more fights do you think she has left? And how is it to fight a train a fighter of her caliber when she's already beat this lady and knocked her out? Honestly, you know, she's super healthy. Her, uh, she, she's one of those athletes that, 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 that I know never has any injuries. She's not somebody who's a, that as far as I know, hasn't had any major surgeries, no major problems. I mean, her body is like really strong. So uh, honestly, I don't see things slowing down. She seems to be getting better all the time. I don't know, man. It seems like she's getting better and her her body is uh, no injury. So things are looking pretty damn good, man, for (laughs) For a long future. I mean, everybody's different. Everybody's different. Some people get banged up. Some people are, are, are fragile bones. Some have like, uh, you know, fragile ligaments, tendons, you know. She is like strong as an ox and uh, built for war. She's ready to go. So so basically, a lot of ladies in for a lot of long nights. <laughs> and she's getting better all the time. It's unbelievable, honestly. Just... The way she moves, I mean, she's not, from 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 my perspective, she's not normal, you know? Like, I don't know what's up with her, but she's not normal, man. She, like, she's a freak athlete, hits crazy hard, and uh, getting better all the time, no injuries. It's, I mean, everybody's different, man. I wish I, I mean, when I was fragile, man, when I was training, I was, stuff was always breaking, my, you know, ligaments were tearing, but not everybody's like that, you know? She's, she's a beast. Yeah, like that's that's really an, an underrated thing uh, about training. Like like you said, like there's a lot of guys that just can't avoid an injury. Like no matter what it is, like just doing routine things, it's like something will get tweaked, you know, here and there, and it's like it'll be like all right, well I can't go as hard as I wanted to today, you know, uh, in preparation. And it, if she's if she's not having any of that, I mean that that kind of zero. <laughs> that's crazy. That's Whatever crazy. it is, I mean everybody's like whether it's like uh, ligament strength, collagen strength bone density, whatever it might be for each person, you know, like, like a guy like Dominic Cruz is, is always banged up, right? Man, <laughs> so many problems. I mean, amazing fighter, best in the world, but his body just is like, is, is not holding up, you know? And like everybody's different, you know? So, uh, but she, her body is, 
as strong as they come. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, there's also that little thing of, uh, I guess, the human body's not supposed to do this. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not good day. for you. <laughs> so, you know, the injuries, I guess, you know, if you can, if you can avoid them, like, you're, you've got a, your special thing going on, special thing going on right there. So <laughs> Fighting's not good for you. No. No. No, no, no. I, I can't. I don't think there's a doctor out there would recommend going and getting punched and kicked in the head. No. <laughs> for an 100%. <laughs> you definitely got to be about that life. I know that's slang talk, but... You can't just sit there. Hey, I want to be. I want to. Well, I say. I, I say you can't just test it out. We had some guys in the in the boxer ring tested out last night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not. Oh yeah, that's right. I didn't see that. How that? Was it that was like, entertaining. Was that entertaining. Is that good? <laughs> I like to see somebody in MMA do the MMA version. The YouTube dudes to the MMA. I think it would be hilarious. <laughs> Well, I mean, they had CM Punk, right? That's <laughs> that was as close. Yeah, that was close. right. Guy who never fought, he's fighting at a high level right away. That was pretty close, yeah. 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 The, the fight, it was entertaining, but it was like, this is so bad it's entertaining type thing. <laughs> but know? sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's more exciting because they don't have any defense. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the low-level guys, or the, the beginners have no defense. So it's right. fun to watch because they're getting clobbered, you know. And that, that's the thing about that fight was like, that was actually one of the things both of them kind of had. They both kind of had that good timing of knowing when to get out, of when to step back. <laughs> oh, they just did? In time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was like, all right, you guys got the step back, like the timing of the step back, right? But it's like the offense still isn't there. So uh, usually it's the other way around. I think. Yeah. Usually like they're not defend themselves. I mean, sometimes they're timid and don't want to engage. That's a problem. But if they engage, they don't know how to block or slip or see punches coming. So that's that's it's usually pretty violent. Yeah. How how would you how would you respond if somebody was like, "Hey, uh, Mike Brown, uh, we got this YouTube superstar that we're going to do this one-off thing with. Are you interested in in training him?" What would be your response? Nah. I mean, I don't have time. Basically, you know. <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, money talks. But like, yeah, right now the dude, the team is killing it. We have so many uh, elite athletes. I don't have time for any. I'm neglecting guys that are in the top 10 that, that should be getting attention, but we have so many good people at the gym. We're struggling, you know, with uh, with being able to, to give give everybody the time they need. <laughs> Mike said, I'm trying to chase them belts. <laughs> Not that YouTube fan. <laughs> like, Come on. No, no. The team, it, it, it's high as it gets, man. Best team in the world over here. Come on. The legitly, that's not a somebody just hyping y'all up. Y'all legitly ATT. No. It's like if I was if I'm looking to fight, I'm going to ATT. Charlie, like they training with champs. Yeah, man, three years in a row. You know, like it's literally the you know the the best dude. We have so many great athletes, and and it's kind of snowballing. It's getting better all the time. Is is it? Do you think the gym will ever get to a point to where you guys have to even expand the gym even more than what it already is? Like size wise and like the facilities, or is it, you know, still running smooth enough to where that's not an issue? I mean, well, we are. We're always kind of like, we've kind of had to a little bit. We we just recently had a spin, you know, like a, a room that was a, for spin bikes, you know, like we had a cardio room that we just like got rid of that and turned into wall to wall wrestling mats, turned into a wrestling room. So it is kind of always kind of growing and expanding and, uh, we're making more room for actual MMA training all the time. Okay. okay. That's pretty cool. I still have yet to, to head out to that facility. I, I, I do want to check it out one of these days pretty soon. It's the Mecca, man. You got to come check it out. 100%. 100%. Yeah, I spend uh, a little bit of time. I train out here in Fortis in, in DFW. So No, great gym. No, great gym, man. Yeah. M- much smaller <laughs> compared to nah, but I'm, got, the world, A world-class gym is a world-class gym. Yes, 100%. Know? Like, yeah, you can tell, you can tell when the – there's high level stuff going on, no matter the size of the facility. Yeah, and it's it's a nice facility. It's not the biggest one in the world, but it's still very nice, very clean. You know, the yeah. guys in there are great. The girls in there are great. You know, yeah. But uh, yeah. that's a whole different animal. Like what, what what I always see the videos of ATT and like the size and just like the you know the scale of what you guys are working with is crazy. And that's that's nice, but I mean, it can be any any time you got some. A handful of world class athletes together, and with you know, then uh, you're going to get some elite training. That it doesn't need to be, you know, big by any means. You know, it's just uh, you just need great fighters and, and solid coaches, and you're good, man. 
Uh, get give us some insight to Joanna, how she feeling and uh, coming fresh off that beat down Michelle Waters since she basically came on a mission. She seek and destroyed and like she getting she should get a, a title shot. Yeah, I think that's what will be next. I mean, she looked great. Mich- Michelle's a, a, a very solid fighter and uh, it was pretty one sided. I mean, kind of as we expected. She uh, better striking, I think, better conditioning, uh, better reach. I mean, she was better better overall. I the it, it makes it makes for an exciting title fight, maybe coming up soon. I think. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. You know, it, I I know this will be her second attempt. You know, at, at a title run. Like, is she going to be as eager? Do you think to go on another like lengthy title defense run like that, or is it just, or is she at the point to where it's like, I just want to prove I can get that title back? No, she's she's as mentally strong as they come. So if anybody can like has the ability to like reel it in and stay focused, it's her. Maybe one of the most mentally tough athletes I've ever come across, male or female. Um, definitely not your average athlete by any means. Uh, insane conditioning, which I think is maybe the most important attribute for a fighter, especially if you fight in five rounds. Um, she's got it, man. She's got a, a strong mind, a strong will, and uh, amazing cardio. So, I mean, you better, you better be ready for a hard five. And uh, not everybody is, but 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 this girl is re- uh, willing to pay the price, and you better be ready to go with her. How cool would that be, just as a personal feather in your cap, to have uh, the the champion at the same time? I, you you t- already had it, but have it at the same time: one fifteen, one thirty five, one forty five, all, all in your back pocket. <laughs> no, that, no, that would be amazing. But it would be be really special to see uh, Joanna get that title back, you know, and I, and I think it's uh, pretty dim likely and it'll be really special and be one of my um, maybe favorite moments ever as a coach, I, I would say. Wow. That, that, uh, why would that be? And uh, I, I'm pretty sure you are probably just on, on your spare time because you're so immersed into the sport. Have you, what, what, what advantages does you want to have over Wiley Zane? Well, I mean, obviously, I think she has, of course, uh, length, striking, uh, pedigree, uh, footwork, uh, and most importantly, I think, uh, cardio conditioning. And, uh, yeah, it, uh, it would be an amazing night, uh, and it's something I look forward to seeing. And before I ask, him, I'll let him ask him one question, um, when she fought, uh, who she fought up here? Jessica Andrade. To me, that was the best technical performance I've seen her. She looked like a female yeah. Vicente Lomachenko. Like everything she did, she was the boss in that ring. She said, ta ta thum. She'd come out, boom, she dictated the terms. She was at a cool pace. She didn't get hit. She basically did everything. Like, if you could put a, like, if I'm teaching a lady how to fight, I'd be, boom, that's what you do right there. Would well, you think that's her best performance? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, that's up there with one of her best ever. Um, I mean, I think foot, you know, footwork and uh, striking differential. Like, she lands. I mean, she's got a high volume. She lands a lot. She doesn't get hit much, and uh, especially if she has, because her footwork is really good. If she has a bit of a reach advantage on you, you're in big trouble, and uh, and that's what she'll have with the next one, I believe. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I can't wait to see it. I, I hope. I hope they go ahead and give her the next uh, the next shot at the title. Um, I don't know. It seems like there's always something kind of finicky going on <laughs> with who's getting these title shots these days. You know, it, sometimes it seems like there's a clear cut number one and it's just like, hey, we're going to go this direction. But I think she's direction. also the most marketable also. Exactly. Right? Like, exactly. That's I mean, I that would say not only is she the clear cut number one, I think she also is the biggest seller. Right. So right. Yeah, it would like, make sense. Yeah, 100 percent. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, if she doesn't get it, it. It would be kind of a shock, I think, to <laughs> who else would it everybody. be? Exactly. Yeah. I, I hear I'm gonna get my baby back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, hundred percent. Do do you guys like uh do you guys have a time frame where you would like it to happen? Or is it just hey when uh you know, I'm not sure. I I think she had a little bit of damage to her, her foot after the last one. Mm. I'm actually supposed to talk to her tomorrow. Um not 
it wasn't nothing broken, but I don't know. She had maybe some ligament problems. I'm I'm not sure. I got to find out exactly what uh, how things are going, how things are healing up. But um, I I she should be good to go. I I don't know. I, I, we'll find out what I think. I'm sure she wants to go sooner than later, but I don't know the time frame for the UFC. Gotcha. Now, are you going to be traveling um, before this this card on the 14th? Do you have you have guys you're going to be in the corner of? Yeah, I got a couple fights. I got next week. I'll go to uh, I leave tomorrow actually to um, Israel for uh, where uh, Sydney Outlaw is fighting Roger Huerta in the UFC uh, in the Bellator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're still fighting Roger there. Huerta. Yeah, did, yeah. Did, did, did you fight him? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sydney Outlaw's a stud, man. Sid, Sydney Outlaw, really strong uh, uh, grappler, black belt in jiu-jitsu under Henzo Gracie, super stud. He's fighting um, Roger Huerta this Thursday in Bellator. Okay. Uh, then I think December 7th I'll have uh, Thiago Alves in D.C. He's fighting Tim Means. Nice, nice. Then I'll be at the December 14th show. Uh, for uh, Amanda, Amanda Nunes. Very nice, very nice. I'll round, out, I'll round out the year with Kayla Harrison fighting for a million bucks in the PFL finals. Yeah, man. Well, when, when's that fight? Is, is she fighting, fighting Sarah Kaufman? No, Sarah lost. Yeah, Sarah oh. lost. Sarah lost in, this, in the semis to um, Larissa Pachenko. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a girl who Kayla had, uh, had beat er in the first round of the tournament. And I had picked for, for an upset over Sarah. <laughs> this was, uh, it was a very tough girl, big girl, strong, strong athlete, very, uh, very tough girl. I thought she was going to give Sarah problems. She's you, very good. Do you think we'll see uh, Kayla in the uh, UFC in the next year or so? I mean, she's happy where she's at. You know, like I think it's going to keep growing. Um, they're taking care of her really well, and uh, hopefully, we bring more athletes to PFL and. and and make uh you know give some power to some of the other shows right now but uh yeah we hope yeah. i hope she gets tough fights but we're, we're pfl is taking care of her very well yeah i think it would be a pay cut at this point if she went to the ufc right <laughs> probably yeah Seriously. i think so yeah, yeah. they're taking care of her yeah yeah she 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 is awesome though like she keeps getting better and better she's she's fun to watch too um and of course with that olympic background it just makes her story special so she's as, she's elite 100 percent. absolutely absolutely well mike man we appreciate your time coming on the show once again kicking it with us giving us the update of the att world for bringing that knowledge <laughs> yes hell yeah thanks for having me you know we, we always got your back over there at att att we want to see you guys <laughs> succeed and uh yeah man we can't wait to see all these these title fights coming up and of course the announcement of johannes title fight whenever that hell yeah it's coming i'm sure <laughs> thanks so much for having me guys appreciate right. it